Hi, thank you for watching this presentation. It's entitled, Is CineCine Sign Language an Isolate? A Call for Further Sign Language Documentation and Description in Papua New Guinea. I'm Samantha Rarick, and I'm a lecturer at Griffith University. Before starting, I'd like to recognize the Kere community and thank them for sharing their language with me. I wanna recognize that this is their language and their culture. I'll do my best to represent it, but I am a hearing person from a hearing family. I'm also an outsider to the community and any errors are my own. This presentation has three parts. The first is a background section where I'll talk a little bit about Sinus in a Sign Language and Kere people who use it. I'll also talk about existing sign language research in PNG. Where I started with this topic is by looking at whether or not Sinus in a Sign Language is an isolate. But realistically, that question has two parts. The first is, is it closely related to any documented sign language? And it seems like the answer is no. Secondly, could there be other closely related languages that are there but have not yet been reported or documented? And the answer is yes, almost certainly. So in the third part of this presentation, I'll also ask you to reflect on how we can better serve signers in PNG. Uh, we'll look at roles and relationships of signers in our own work, and I'll provide some of my own reflections on how I can improve my approaches. Starting with what do we know about sign languages in PNG, it's actually very little. Fewer than 10 have been reported. Most of those were reported in the past couple years. Some of the earliest research with sign languages here started with Adam Kendon's description of a system used in Anga province in 1980. Sometimes that's also called a sign language of Upper Lagaip Valley or Engen sign language, depending on the author. There's also a sign language used in Port Moresby and Deaf Schools, Papua New Guinean sign language, that is fairly well documented, but its research with it is still ongoing. And then Kyle Gay sign language is a language that's being documented and described by researchers at the ANU, Alan Rumsey and Lauren Reed. Um, my work focuses on this last one, Sinasina sign language, which is where I'll focus before comparing it to the other sign languages that have been well documented. Here you'll see a map from a recent publication by Reed and Rumsey talking about sign languages that have been reported in PNG, which are marked with the black dots. Not all of these have been well documented, even if they have been reported. On this slide, you'll see the sign languages that have been fairly well documented or described and that I'll focus on for this presentation. So in the South and Port Moresby, we have Papua New Guinean sign language. Up here in Anga province is that system described by Kendon in 1980. To the east, in Western Highlands province, we have Kyle Gay sign language. And then this last one near Karoka is Sinisthina sign language. That's actually used in Chimbu province. Sinisthina sign language, SSSL, is a small sign language used about by about four deaf and 50 hearing people in the Kere community and neighboring communities in Sinisthina Valley of Chimbu province. Linguists know very little about this language at present. It was first reported in 2016 when I was doing field work with the spoken language of the Kere community, Kere. It's definitely a micro community language. It's used by a small number of people in this area, and it's certainly endangered. All of these signers today are adults. There are no child signers. There are no deaf children in the community. Deaf signers right now age in ra range in age between about 70 and about 20. So the oldest signer was born sometime before 1950, and the youngest was born around the year 2000. None of these deaf signers are currently raising children. Documentation and description are ongoing, but it's also a concern about language shift right now. Language shift could 
occur very quickly here, despite the fact that currently the language is used in all domains when deaf people are present. Before moving on, I'm just going to take a quick moment to remind us why work with small sign languages matter. Firstly, deaf sinus and a sign language signers are largely underserved. Generally, deaf people in the Sinusina Valley have fewer opportunities in various parts of their daily lives compared to their hearing peers, and they've also been left out of research in this area generally, as I'll discuss later. There are no, um, there are no education opportunities in any sign language in Sinusina or in Chimbu, and as a result, almost all deaf signers of Sinusina sign language have completed fewer years of school than their hearing peers. Some have not attended school at all. All deaf sinus and sign language signers are subsistence farmers, unlike many of their peers, including those deaf signers who live in town where it would be much more common to have a wage paying job. In addition to this, language shift and loss could happen very quickly. Currently, there's no other sign language used in the area that could trigger this shift, but if that happened, there are so few signers, there aren't these more prestigious domains, that type of shift could happen very rapidly. Even without shift, this language is on track to become dormant in the coming years as those older signers are no longer with us and there's no intergenerational transmission at the time at this time. As a result, if this were to happen, deaf Kere children in the future could be born into a situation where they do not have access to any sign language, which would be really problematic for their lives. And then lastly, there are broader implications of this type of work for linguistic research generally, including typological contributions. So turning to this question where I started, is Sinistin a sign language an isolate? As I mentioned before, this question has two parts. Firstly, is it closely related to any documented sign language? And secondly, could there be closely related languages that have not yet been reported or documented? At this point, there's no evidence that Sinistin a sign language is closely related to any documented sign language. I started my analysis here, which is very preliminary, with a lexical comparison based on the Swadesh list modified for sign languages, and I compared phonological parameters of core vocabulary. This analysis is preliminary, and the comparison with the sign language, sign language used in Kyle I had some issues with the data early on, and so this is still in, under investigation and is not included in this chart. Generally, this draws from limited data, but there's still no shared vocabulary that's higher than 50%. This suggests that there's not a close relationship between Sinus and a sign language and any of the sign languages of the highlands that it could be in contact with, it could be related to, or with Papua New Guinean sign language, which it could be in contact with. The idea that these languages probably aren't in close contact and probably aren't closely related is also supported by morphosyntactic evidence and by signers' knowledge. Looking at things like basic word order, negation, and other word order patterns, we can see that Papua New Guinean Sign Language and Sinusina Sign Language have very little in common. The system used in ENGA does share some features with Sinus and a sign language that could suggest there's a relationship there, but the features that it shares aren't especially unusual across languages. So this isn't strong evidence that they are related even though there are these similarities. Many languages are SOV. Many languages are verb and then the negator. Many sign languages have some sort of topic question order. So the next thing to look at is non-manual markers, focusing especially on sinus and the sign language and the system used in ENGA. All of these things are pretty common 
And so again, even though there's similarities where there's minimal pairs for non-manual markers, isn't especially uncommon. A head shake as a negator isn't especially uncommon. These types of non-manual question markers are not uncommon across languages. Sinus in a sign language, however, does have an aspectual lip rounding durative marker that has not been reported in the system used in ENGA, the sign language used in ENGA, or in any other sign language reported in PNG. So that could suggest that this is an innovation. And again, there's no evidence here that these are closely related languages. So next we turn to signers knowledge. Sinus in a sign language signers regularly report that other people in PNG sign differently, especially people in larger towns like Garoga. We've made some early attempts to investigate mutual intelligibility too between Sinus in a sign language and Kyle's gay sign language. Lauren Reed showed some recordings of signers I work with to signers she works with in Kyle Gay. And as she reports in her master's thesis, one signer reported that he was able to understand one of the sentence in the sign language signers I work with, but not a second signer from the same area that I work with. And so this is really interesting and certainly for, warrants further investigation. But thirdly, and really importantly, is the issue of identity. With spoken languages in this area, language labels often overlap, overlap with clan identities. And that aspect of identity is really salient for people. So we could find that there are more or fewer sign languages here than are supported by the linguistic evidence I've laid out based on people's identity. I think it's probably likely that much like spoken languages, mutual intelligibility will and grammatical comparisons will carry less weight than people's knowledge that they do or do not belong to certain clan groups. So the evidence up to this point suggests that there are not close relationships between Sinus and a sign language and any other sign language that has been reported and documented. That leads to the second part of answering whether or not this is an isolate by addressing the fact that there could be other closely related languages in this area. This region is one that has extremely high cultural and spoken language diversity. Signers know that people in PNG sign differently and perhaps even in their region sign differently. These things certainly suggest that there's more diversity of sign languages than has been reported and documented by linguists up to this point. It also leads to broader questions that, in my opinion, are more interesting and more important. How can we better serve signers and sign languages, especially in PNG? In this last section, I'm going to talk about why we should do more, but also ask you to reflect on how individually and as teams we can do more. Language endangerment and shift could happen very quickly here. Language access for future deaf people is a concern. One way to start doing more is to ask about these concerns with members of your community or the community you work with and see what you can do together to start to address them. Generally, Sinus and Assigned Language Signers have told me that they want recognition for working with their language, but primarily they want skills and opportunities that can help address the educational and occupational gaps and disadvantages that they face. Signers in your community or the community you work with might face similar barriers. That could be another place to start. Of course, there will be challenges for this type of work. COVID-19 has certainly impacted my work, but we can and should be doing more. 
So I want to ask you to take a moment and reflect on your own work, especially if you're a hearing person who exclusively works with spoken languages. Ask yourself, what are the roles of signers in my work? Have I been building relationships with signers in my community or in the community I work with? Why or why not? How or how not? What have I done to include or exclude them? What more can I do? And as a starting point, you can ask. Ask the signers in your community or the community you work with. There's a growing body of literature on this topic. I'll provide some recommendations at the end. And of course, we have many colleagues, especially deaf colleagues, who are experts. Please take some time to reflect on these questions and the questions that they lead to, and then continue that discussion with other members of your team. Please don't just add a line to a grammar of a spoken language that says a sign language is used and then never follow up. I know that there's definitely some things that I can improve. Adjusting goals, reflecting on roles, and building relationships in my work are all things that I've worked on to varying extents, but I know that I can do more. So I'm gonna start by spending more time on these things thinking about how I can further reorient my goals and the goals of our projects to match those of deaf sinus and assigned language signers. I need to spend more time inviting deaf signers into decision-making roles and making room for them if that's what they wanna do. And I also need to spend time building more collaborative relationships with deaf colleagues. These are the things that I'm gonna start spending more time on. I hope that your own reflections are productive as well. Coming back to this first question, is Sinus in a Sign Language an isolate? Maybe? There's no evidence that it's closely related to any documented sign language, but it's certainly possible that there are other sign languages in the region that are closely related but haven't yet been documented or reported. This also leads to more important questions about how we need to address, that we need to address about signers and sign languages that may have been excluded from existing research. Overall, there's a clear need to diversify our documentation and conservation efforts so that they are multilingual and multimodal, and that they include signers and sign languages. Broadening our efforts to consistently include small sign languages has potential to better serve signers and secondarily to contribute to more theoretical questions for linguistics like, is sinus in a sign language an isolate? Thank you again for your time. I'd like to share some recommended resources with you and to thank Julie Hoxang for sharing many of these resources with me. There is another, there's a panel on Thursday of the conference that looks specifically at complex dynamics and relationships in sign language documentation. Professor Lin Ho has put together a bibliography of work that is relevant and might be useful to you if you're getting started. And so has Professor Julie Hoxang are some other resources that you might find useful. Thank you again, and I look forward to your questions.